I will. Thank you. Somebody don't have to wash a horse's wound every morning at 5 a.m. Uh, that's cold. <laughs> uh, I think the horse is going to survive. Uh, yeah, because if the horse don't make it, they will I'm not as worried about the horse as I am my daughters. <laughs> but uh, but we've got her, we've got her covered uh, and got him taken care of. But uh. But I will say this, that it is at 25 degrees with what cold water running, it's fun. Uh, Acts 17, uh, what a blessing it is to look at this message, uh, what I would call tonight the message on Mars Hill, and uh, a very prominent message. I've never, uh, I've never preached this before, I've never studied this out before, but I'm going to begin reading in, in verse number 16, but in order to get there, I want to kind of uh, show you as we go into chapter 17, Paul approached things from a regular routine. He strategically, through the work of the, and the leading of the Holy Spirit, he entered into a city. It was always through the Spirit of God's leading because we know from previous chapters that he has been redirected and rerouted before by the Holy Spirit. He has actually went into cities and from what we've been told and what we've learned has been commanded not even to preach. And uh, he's, been, uh, he's, uh, he's been restricted, he's been rerouted, but as always there's a strategic city that he goes into. When he enters into that strategic city, he always starts in a synagogue. When he starts in that synagogue, he does one thing, and he reasons and preaches from the Scripture. In other words, basically, if you could see Paul operating in the synagogue with a set of Jewish uh, priests or a set of Jewish believers within this synagogue, Paul would literally be sharing Scripture and asking questions. I look at Paul as kind of not just a great preacher, but I also look at, look at him as a great teacher as well. One of, the greatest, one of the things that I've learned about some of the greatest teachers that I've ever encountered was a great teacher has the ability to ask, the right, ask good questions. Um, some of my greatest teachers in school never gave me the direct, a direct answer. Always frustrated me until I became a teacher myself. And um, one of the things that I've learned is this, is when a kid or somebody asks you a question, a lot of times you have to ask, answer them by answering with another question to lead their thoughts into the right places, which leads me to, be, lead, leads me to believe that Paul not only preached the gospel while he was within those synagogues, but that word reasoned with the scriptures is what the word says, um, uh, in verse number two, it reasoned with them out of the scriptures means that Paul would sit down and legitimately ask questions to them, making them think for themselves. That is something that is uh, very important as individual believers that we learn to reason through the scriptures. And we learn to operate with that. It is not something that I can do for you or I can make you do. It is something that the Spirit of God has to do and your life and your heart has to be illuminated. Now, the results, uh, the, the, the routine was to strategically enter a city, start in a synagogue, and reason and preach the Scriptures. The results were always normally the same. Some would believe and most of them would be Gentiles. Now, 
The resistance would always come out of this. Resistance, and here's the thing that I learned as I studied this more in depth, and this is just review. Resistance was always coming by the unbelieving Jews. You'd have a Jewish crowd that would believe, and then you would have the unbelieving Jews. And, Mo, and it was always, everywhere Paul went, the resistance always was motivated. Please hear this. It was motivated by envy. They were jealous. They did not like what they were hearing. And <laughs> isn't it amazing, rather than, rather than agree to disagree or just believe and go on about your business, they were motivated by envy to the point that they wanted to not just not believe, but they wanted to destroy what you believed. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Sounds real parallel to what the liberal and atheistic agenda is in today's society. They don't just want to disagree and, and, and move on with life. Not only do they not want to disagree with you, but they want to disagree and absolutely wipe out everything else that you and I would stand for and believe. That is why there's attack. There is the beginning stages of an attack on the Christian church in America. And it's going to do nothing but elevate itself in the near months to come. I promise you this, that there is an attack on the way. It's already here. It's in our courts. It's on our. It's uh. It's in our land. It's in. It, it, it's sitting around us. Every the, there's people that are deceived. There's people that are evil, and this evilness is being pumped and primed, and it's raising its voice louder and louder and louder. And the attack has come. And rather than just say, "Why don't we leave them alone? Let them do their thing, and we do our thing." Rather than leave them alone, we want to shut them up, we want to close them out, and if all costs, we truly, the reality of it is, is they want us killed. And if you don't believe that that is right here in our land, I've got oceanfront property in Arizona to say. Because it's here, it's raising its voice, the heathen, please hear me, Psalms 46 is, cre is correct, the heathen rage. But let me, let me give you a good gospel vitamin on a, sun, on a Wednesday night, on a cold Wednesday night. The heathen may rage, but God in Psalms 46 has already declared, stand, he says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted. God gets the final laugh. I can promise you this. God gets the final say so. You can do it what down here where grace is free and salvation is full. Or you can do it later where judgment is coming. And when judgment falls, there will be no retreats. There will be no second chances. It will be condemnation and it will be judgment. And there will not be another opportunity. There is coming a time, church, where... Mercy is going to come to an end in God's economy. There's coming a time. Now, this was Paul's normal activity. We find himself moving into Athens, a place with Greek mythology, a place of great culture, a place that the Athenians understand this. Basic background right here. The Athenians are, uh, and the people who live in Athens, they believed that they were elite. They were the top of the top dogs. They were the best in the military. They were the smartest among the smartest. They were the most intellectual. This is where you get your philosophy. Uh, uh, this is where we get our philo the, the concept of philosophy. Some of our mathematics come from, a lot of our foundations of mathematics come from this era and this group of people right here. Um, I mean, many of us have probably uh, heard of, of, of some of the mathematical, some of our languages, some of our, uh, uh, some of our alphabet, some of our uh, communication comes from this, I mean, very philosophical and very intellectual group of people. Smart. Elite, wealthy, but I want you to see now when people would go to Athens, they would be 
enthralled with what they saw. Architecture was unreal amazing at this time. I mean, they were building and putting stuff out that no place in the world would have. If you were a tourist during this time, you would be completely mesmerized by what you saw. But I want you to see what, impressed, what Paul was impressed by. What impressed upon the heart of Paul as he maneuvered through Athens and began to see the philosophy, the art, the architecture, the poetry, the philosophies. He began to see the, the lifestyles that was being lived, the wealth, the prosperity, captivated to a tourist. But let's find out what it did to the Apostle Paul. Let's begin reading. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, he was signaling for Tim, uh, Tim, uh, Timothy or Timaeus and Silas. He was waiting for them to come. His spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. This is verse 16. When he saw the city wholly given to idolatry, was he impressed or mesmerized by the architecture? Absolutely not. Did he, was he mind blown by the artwork he probably witnessed going down the streets? No, it didn't do him any good. Do you know what bothered and what was impressed upon the heart of Paul was the idolatry that was on every corner in which he walked. I can't help but tell you right now that when we read this message and hear what Paul and see what Paul saw, it is almost scary at the parallel that we see right now in the American culture today. It was consumed with idolatry. It was overwhelmed with, with, uh, with, with wickedness. It was, it was consumed in paganism. I have said this before and I'll say this to the day I die. I think some of the greatest idol worship in America takes place every Sunday morning. We worship things and we don't worship God. And I'll get to that in just a little bit. Therefore, what he did after he saw that, he was stirred in his spirit. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers, um, Epicureans and Stoics encountered him. And, and some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods. Because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. See, these were not scriptural, intellectual people. These were pagan, pagan philosophers that had never heard the gospel before. And they took him and brought him into uh, Arapagus and saying, "We know what this new, we uh, may we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speaketh is." For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. And we would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the strangers uh, which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Now watch what Paul says. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill, very popular, very uh a uh, populated area, and said, You men of Athens, I perceive in all things you are too superstitious. That sounds funny, doesn't it? Now hold on a second. We're going to find out that Paul wasn't as, uh, Paul wasn't as legalistic with this group as you might think he is when we study this out. So put a pen in that little word right there. For I, as I passed by, and beheld your devotions. I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Whom therefore you ignorantly worship him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein. Seeing that he is, the Lord, he is Lord of heaven and earth. Dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with man's hand as though he needeth anything. Seeing he giveth all a life and breath and all things. 
and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation, that they, uh, that they should seek the Lord, if halfway they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of our own poets have ye, uh, of your own poets have ye said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto silver, gold, or silver, or stone, graven by art or man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commanded all men everywhere to repent. What a powerful statement he just brought down. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he has given assurance, uh, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of dead, some mocked and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among which was Dionysus, Dionysus the uh, Arapagite, and a woman named Demarius, and others with him. I want to I want to share and teach off of this off of this message. Basically, what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to outline this sermon and I'm going to entitle it just what Paul entitled it, The Unknown God. Will you pray with me? Father, help us tonight in Jesus' name. Hide me behind the cross. Keep our youth safe as they go and, and uh, buy gifts for, um, for children and buy gifts for uh, uh, folks that are going to need help this Christmas season. Lord, I thank you for a given church. I thank you for a loving church. But God, take this word tonight and embed it in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul did something that was very, in you, very helpful. Paul operated with what I would call a very apologetically, and a very, a very good apologetic platform. He started with where they were at in order to get him, get them to where he needed to be. You see, Paul did not start with some major philosophy or some deep theology. Paul started right where they were. Paul looked around and he was disturbed in his spirit. He was bothered in his spirit by the idolatry in which he saw. He was bothered in his spirit by, by the worship in which they were worshiping. It didn't change the fact that he was convicted to the hill. He wasn't impressed by the architecture. He wasn't impressed by the artwork. He wasn't impressed by the wealth. He was impressed by what was impressed upon his heart and what was the burden upon his heart was the lost condition in which they worshiped them. Boy, that is the American church culture in, in, in today's time is this lost condition in what they worship in. We, we, we go through religious routines and religious rituals and we go through the steps and we go through the motions. But the reality of it is, is I believe that sitting in our churches across America today are many, many people who are trying to worship a God that they have no knowledge of. It is an unknown God to them. They don't know who he is, they don't know what he is, and they don't know how to even begin to deal with, with the scenario. They do recognize that there is an and there is a God. They do recognize that he is out there, but they have no true knowledge. They may be they may carry a title of Baptist or Methodist or Presbyterian or non-denominational. But when it comes down to the fact that they worship, they worship and they don't even know what or who they are truly worshiping. And the Greeks, and then are the Athenians in this case, were very honest with that. In their philosophy, they were, they were the, the concept of unknown, literally, if you study that word unknown, it literally means it's where we get our, our word agnostic from. That is where that word comes, unknown. In other words, an agnostic believes that there's, they, they have a belief that there is something out there, but they don't know what it is or can't identify it. 
They're not completely atheistic, but they're, they're everything that, that, that is out of their mindset that they can actually explain, they don't understand. And Paul didn't walk in like a bull in a china shop right here and go blazing guns and throwing, uh, uh, throwing, uh, throwing legalistic darts at him. He could have. And I've seen a many Baptist preachers that would have walked into this city and would have lit them up and not seen one convert out of it. I've seen a many illegalistic people that would have stood up and would have found something in one person or something in another person or something in this group or something in that group and a went to preaching and a harping on it and a dealing with it. But the reality of it is, is Paul understood that they didn't have any knowledge of what they were, what he was talking about. So he had to get their attention, captivate them for a little bit. And in all reality, what Paul actually did in that first statement was he actually complimented them. He gained their attention by complimenting them. Was he burdened with the idolatry? You better believe he was burdened. He was stirred in his spirit. That wasn't just a small statement. But the outside of it is, is that not only was he stirred in his spirit, but he knew that he needed to be able to have their ability to listen to them and not cut them off. So he began by complimenting. He found something to compliment them with. And I have a feeling he had to look a little bit for this. Because I feel like Paul was boiling, raging mad because he, listen, you put somebody with a zeal for God and the scriptures and the holiness and piety of God in the midst of a wicked world, and I promise you this, they will be pilgrims and foreigners in that land. They will not be comfortable. They will not be happy. They will not be at ease. And I guess that's one of the reasons I'm getting closer and closer to the reality of uncomfortableness in this world. I don't even know if that's a word or not, but it's my word. If I'm getting more and more uncomfortable in this world, it's because the more crazy this thing gets, the less comfortable I feel because I realize that this place is not my home. And down deep inside, there is a holy fire burning inside of me. And I'm trying my best for the help of the Holy Spirit and a lot of help from my wife to keep my mouth muzzled so that I don't hurt somebody before I'm able to give them the gospel. Thank God for both in the day and hour that we're living in. The last 18 months, both of them need a medal for what they've had to funnel me through. But at the same time, Paul was, I can sense in his spirit that he was boiling. It said he was stirred. I mean, he was not happy with what he was seeing. But he complimented him. He found, he found something. I look at Paul. Paul started this out like I normally have ever started a parent conference with a student. Usually if a parent ever gets that phone call from a student, they know it ain't good. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? By the way, I've got those calls I never will forget, I'll have to tell you this. This is just free Wednesday night stuff. Avery was about, Avery's not here, so I can talk about her. Miss Harris, uh, Miss Harris was a, a black lady. It was her king, kindergarten teacher. Miss Harris was one of the most godly women. She's gone home to be with the Lord right now. She had a brain aneurysm a, a little over a year ago, I think, about two years ago, I guess it was, and went home to be with the Lord. Miss Harris was one of the most godly, strict, she's a little old bitty, frail looking black lady. But I can tell you this, if she would have walked up to me and said, Pastor Boatman, jump, I'd have said, how high you want me to jump? I mean, that's how she, she had that ability. Uh, Miss Harris called me one day. She, uh, I got a phone call from Grace Christian School in Columbus. She said, they, they said, Miss Harris would like to talk to you about your daughter, Avery. I was sitting there and my blood was boiling already. I said, she ain't going to make it this evening. I was thinking, what has she, what has that girl done? And I get on the phone and I'm sitting there and said, Miss Harris, Avery would like to talk to you. And I got on the phone and she said, and Avery said, Daddy, I got saved today. Miss Harris led Avery to the Lord. Um, that day, right after the chapel service, led Avery to Christ. Or right after the, their Bible time, led Avery to Christ. But I, um, but you know, you know, when we've always had those parent teacher conferences, I don't know if you've ever been some of you ever parents have ever been in one. I've been in a time a couple of them a time or two. And, uh, and as a teacher, one of the things I always practiced was I always knew 
when I was about to have this, there was going to be at least one mad parent walking in. And I, I was determined to win that one over. They were already on the defense. My little angel wouldn't have failed this test if you'd have been doing your job. No way. You know what I'm saying? They were already on the defense. I mean, they walked in with them. I mean, they were ready for me to just walk in and tell them everything that was jacked up about their kid. And always, as a, as a teacher, I, always, I, I was always determined to do one thing. The one, if there was just one parent, I knew I, but if there was two, it was a battle. But usually with one parent, the first thing I did, I don't care if that was the most jacked up kid I ever taught, I found something that I could brag on that child right out of the gate with. It may have taken some prayer before I had to do it, and the Holy Ghost had to show me what was good in that kid, but I found something somewhere because right out of the gate I had to compliment that child and that parent. And usually if I could provide that compliment, it let their, because you've got to understand, these people in this city was already, their, their, uh, their guard was already up. And I know Paul sensed that. They were already sitting there with a gun basically pointed at him, right? Because this dude's preaching some resurrection stuff that we ain't never heard before. So you've got to understand that they were already on guard. They were already bristled and ready for attack. And so Paul kind of calmed the atmosphere by saying, Hey, I perceive y'all are a bunch of superstitious people. Literally, that word superstitious in the context, does it means religious. I, I perceive y'all. And to that group of people, that, that was a compliment. Now to Paul, it, it was a... It was an appalling indictment. But they didn't know that. To them, they were thinking in their minds, oh, he just complimented. Because didn't he say, I notice your devotions? They were devoted people, but they were devoted to the wrong things. Sounds like the American people, doesn't it? Sounds like the American culture, doesn't it? They were, they were devoted, but they're devoted to the wrong things. I, and the thing about it is, is if you look at you look at if our society and our country right now today, you would be able to identify that there are some devoted people. They're just devoted to the wrong things. And, it's, and, and the scary thing is, is many of them hold positions of leadership in our churches. That's the scariest part. Now, he says this. He says, he compliments them. He tells them they're religious. He said, and look at what he starts with. He doesn't start with scripture he starts apologetically with, with an inscription on, an, uh, on one of their own altars. He says, I noticed you had an inscription on one of your altars and it says, to the unknown God. That's where Paul started his platform. He said, I'm about to make known this God that you have no idea what's on this altar. I'm about to make it known. When he, when he set out to make this known, you've got to understand the background of the, of the Athenian culture and the Athenian philosophy. It's the same thing that we see today. Basically, what people are trying to do, they're trying to answer three questions. Every human has to answer three questions or tries their best to answer three questions. Everybody does. One, where did I come from? Where did I come from? Did you know science has been trying to answer that question for years now? Now, there's been some educated idiots that have popped up on the scene in the recent years that have come to the realization that we have formed from some sort of amoeba out of a mucus millions and millions of years ago. I, I, I can't help but chuckle sometimes at their theories. Darwin himself even came to a place where he refuted his own, uh, his own theory of evolution. I, I believe that in the beginning, God, where did I come from? I come from my creator, and we'll get to that in just a second. But people have always tried to answer the question, where did I come from? And science and philosophy has done their dead level best to answer that question without adding God to it. 
And I'll be honest with you, from my standpoint, and I'm not an uneducated person, church. I'll just go ahead and say that. I've got a degree in mathematics. I've also got a master's from Liberty University. I'm not uneducated. I've got a lot of books that are really smart. They're a lot smarter than I am. And I will say, as an uneducated, as, a, as, as what I would say as an educated person, science has failed miserably in answering that question. Why? It's because they are trying to do it without the main ingredient. God. The next question people try to ask if they can't get the, the next question, not only where did I come from, but why am I here? I guarantee you, if you've lived long enough, you've asked that same question. What did you put me here for? What is my purpose? Not only does science try to answer that question, but philosophy tries to answer that question. Why am I here? Humanism would say that you're here to be your own being and you become eventually you will become your own God. That's what humanistic thought says. And, and to be honest with you, that's the mindset of the secular educational agenda now is to, is to, uh, is to indoctrinate the next generation and understanding is you have the ability to be your own God. And that is a philosophical way of trying to work your way through life without putting God in the scenario. One of the major pushes of atheism is to, is to eliminate your purpose and you're here to just enjoy yourself and after you're done, you're done. That's an awful shallow form of existence if you ask me. I believe, but the third question is, where am I going? What's going to happen when I die? Because we know that's a reality, right? Science makes attempts at these questions. Philosophy makes attempts at this question. But did you know that the Christian faith and is the Christian faith is the only one that's got an answer for all three? It's the only one that has an answer for all three. And Paul answers those questions right here. Number one, as we read this tonight, I want you to notice what Paul declares about this unknown God that they, are, they have inscribed at their altar. This unknown God that he is talking about, watch what Paul says right here. He says, I noticed, he said, I, I found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God whom therefore you ignorantly worship." Now he's getting a little bit testy. You ignorantly worship. You see what the thing is about the Athenians is this: is they had all they they had all the intellect in the world, but they were overcome with ignorance towards God. They knew and they believed and they perceived that there was something greater and something bigger out there than them. And rather than turn to God or look at the creation and notice that there was a creator, they turned to all these other paganistic gods of their own mind and their own hands that they created themselves. And it goes back to what Romans says is they worship the, cre the, the, the creature rather than the creator. And so the first thing that Paul addresses out of this is he says this. He, said, he says, Him declare I unto you. I'm about to tell you about who this God is. So when I get done, he'll no longer be unknown, but you'll know him exactly as I'm about to lay him out to you. Number one, what is this unknown God? Number one, he is the creator. It says that the God of this the God made the world and all things therein. Seeing he is the Lord of heaven and earth, he dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though, he is, as though he needeth anything. Seeing he giveth all to all, uh, he giveth to all life and breath and all things. The first thing that Paul speaks about in this per in this in, in, in this in this oration or in this apologetic sermon about this about who God really is is the first thing that he lays out is the fact that he is the creator. He speaks of the greatness of God, that he is not bound by time, he is not bound by substance, he is not bound by uh, matter, he exists not only inside, but at the same time he exists outside. He is above all. The back, the Colossians says that he, uh, uh, he is all and in all. In other words, he is not bound by time. He is not bound. He is not, he's an 
an infinite God is what he's trying to say is this. Is what God is saying. What he's saying about this is this is not a God that has. He is a God that has no limits to him. He is the ultimate creator. And when you start to begin to talk to somebody that don't have any idea about the uh, knowledge of God, you can't start in John 3.16. Guess where Paul went? He went right back to Genesis 1. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, who is he? He's God. He is the creator of all things. You know, you notice what? Where did I come from? I come from God. I come from his mind. That's why he says in Psalms 139, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy work. That my nut soul knoweth right well. Where did, where did I come from? I come from my creator. I didn't come from an amoeba out of the water somewhere. I didn't transform it from a monkey into a human being. I came from the mind of my creator. I came from God Almighty. I am. You can think what you want to. And the world can have their own philosophy if they want to. And they can believe that they're here by happenstance. But I'm here to tell you that I've done read scripture. I don't know that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I don't know. I've done found out that I am his workmanship. I am a masterpiece. Isaiah says I'm a royal diadem in the hand of my God. I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now. I know who my, who my creator is and he is God. And he was before all things. That's what he's saying. He says basically two things. He tells those Athenians, the God that you're saying is unknown, he is the creator of everything. <laughs> he is both infinite and independent. Boy, those are two theological concepts that if we could embrace about God would make us very, very happy. He is infinite, meaning he has no boundaries, and he has no limits. That's why he specializes in things thought impossible. <laughs> Have you ever thought about the creativity of God for just a moment? Considered the fact that there's no way. There is no scientific, logical, or philosophical way evolutionary thought could ever put together the the, uh, uh, the the minuteness of God's creation called the human body. One little microscopic cell gets jacked up inside of us and we are sick for weeks. Yet the same God that created that cell is the same God that created the universe, the stars, and the galaxies. You can't... <laughs> oh, hallelujah. You can't look at a building and tell me there's not a builder. You can't look at a piece of artwork and tell me there's not an artist. And friends, you can't step out into creation and tell me there's not a creator. He created everything. No, he's infinite, meaning he is not bound by our time. He is not bound by our thought. He is not bound by our logic. But he's also independent in the fact that he says, I don't need man's hands to make me anything. I don't need that. Can I give you a gospel vitamin on a Wednesday night? Oh, I hope you get this. This will... <laughs> Woo! I'm about to say it and I'm already excited about it. God doesn't need us. He wants us. God doesn't need me. God wants me. Have you ever just... The same God that has the precision of that cell in the vastness of the universe. He doesn't need me. He's independent from me. But he wants me. And let me tell you something. God doesn't need you. He wants you. That's why he saved you. So what's the first thing he tells us? 
He speaks of God's greatness by telling us that he is the creator. That's the first thing he starts with. He starts with creation, in the beginning God. But then he goes on and he says that he is, in verse 25, he says not only is he is the creator, he is our provider. In verse 25 he says he is neither worshipped with man's hands as though he, he needeth anything. Watch this now, here's his provision. Seeing he giveth to all life, breath, and all things. God is the giver. In other words, this not only speaks of his greatness and his creation and his creativity, but we see that he, it speaks of his goodness in the fact that he does two things. He gives life and he sustains life. Did you know Colossians 1.17 says this, By him all things consist. Y'all have heard me harp on this for the last couple of weeks, but it's about to come all together in one. It says that he, he giveth life, breath, and all things. By him are all things conceived. Not only does he create all things, doesn't James teach us that, what's, uh, uh, that every good gift and every perfect gift comes from where? Comes from above? Doesn't James teach us that? But here's the thing. God gives life. He is not a, he's not just a, he's a provider and it speaks of his goodness. Every, uh, we don't realize that our very existence is pinned on the very goodness of God himself. In other words, God's goodness is not depicted based on us or our circumstances. It's based on his nature and who he is himself. And what, he's, what Paul is teaching the Athenians right here is that he is not just a creator and that he is this great God. It's that he's a good God that provides life, breath, and all things. He is not only a giver, but he's also a sustainer. He holds all things together. Have you ever tried to juggle through juggle life? I have. Ever feel like you dropped the ball a couple of times? <laughs> like I did this morning, maybe. Yeah, like I've done throughout my day. Uh, you're, you're going through life and you're holding on to... And I'm going to preach this one day. I'm going to preach this. Dear God, I'm going to preach this. I wish I had just a set of softballs that I could just write different things on there. We're trying to handle our kids. Trying to handle our marriage. Trying to handle our job. Trying to handle our health. Trying to handle our finances. <laughs> and, you're, and you're sitting there holding it. Ever, do you ever feel like you're holding a big old pile of softballs in your hand? Or basketballs? <laughs> and you're sitting there holding them and, and it, and it's like life just keeps piling everything on you and you can't hold it all. You can't, sus you, can <laughs> you can't sustain it all. I hope you're glad. You I'm glad I came on a Wednesday night tonight to get this. This is helping me. You can't sustain it all and you can't hold it all and it's all just this one big juggling act and it's all, and, and, and ever so often, there's one of your kids. Boop, there they go. And all you do is just watch them roll. <laughs> and then, then as you're chasing that one, trying to chase it down, boop, boop, there goes your finances right through there. Oh my gosh, I'm bankrupt. Does anybody other than me feel like that's your life right now sometime? Now, it's, not, it's not a softball, it's not a basketball. This is like a a 20 pound wall ball called COVID that just got dropped on us and now we're balancing this bad boy with all this other little stuff that we're holding on to. <laughs> now you got all the mandates and, the, and all the rules and the, all the speculation and all the opinions of everybody. And now if you do, you do. If you don't, you don't. And you just, I mean, you just, if one group going one group, you don't. If you there that ball goes. Boy, that made a dent when it hit. Trying to sustain it. That's what the Athenians was doing. They had all these balls called gods. And they were holding on to them themselves. And God says, you know what? He don't need you to hold on to this. Just saying this makes that song He's got the whole world in his hands. 
He's got it all. He's not just the creator. He's the sustainer. He's got the little bitty babies in his hands. He's got my job in his hands. He's got my finances in his hands. And I'm sitting here trying to juggle it. And God's over here saying, if you just let me handle it, I won't drop not near a ball. I have dropped many of them. Y'all heard that state saying, I dropped the ball. So here's the deal. Y'all can, can my Wednesday night group make a deal with me? In the near future, if I preach a message called I dropped the ball, y'all act like y'all hadn't ever heard anything about it, okay? Will y'all do that for me? Just pretend like y'all. All right, now don't even write it in your notes. Just act like it's cut. Like, just, just know that there's a message coming to a church near you entitled, I Dropped the Ball. The thing about it is, how many of you have ever said that? Man, I dropped the ball on that one. Y'all heard that phrase before? I dropped the ball on this one. Let me tell you something. Paul's telling these opinions. God had never dropped the ball on nothing. He's got it in control. He is the provider. Speaks of his goodness. I'm going to move quickly. Then verse, and in the set third thing, verses 26 through 29, he speaks of his ruler. He is ruler. He says in verse 29, For as much then as we are hit the offspring of God, we ought not to think of that Godhead as like unto gold, silver, or stone, graving by the art of man's device. He goes on as, as you back up, he begins to talk about, For we live and move and um, and have our own being as certain also of his own poets have said. In other words, Paul even used the philosophy of the Athenians' own poets and their philosophies to prove of God's existence as not only creator, provider, but also ruler. It speaks of not only his greatness, his goodness, but it speaks of his government. He is the ultimate authority. He is the Godhead, and He does not operate uh, and, and is not a likened to gold or silver or stone, graven or controlling. In other words, God is not some distant God that is uninterested in the affairs of man. God is a governing God that is in control and is very interested in the affairs of humanity. He's very involved. Very involved. Even when it feels like He's not involved, He is involved. And then the last one, Paul gets to this point. Can you imagine being in Athens on Mars Hill? All these intellectuals, all these philosophers, all these poets, all these people that think you're better than he is. And he's already told you that God's already there. And the Athenians thought they were the ultimate race. God, and Paul basically said that there's only one race, it's called the human race. Boy, I had to set some of them off right there. So far out of what he's saying, and then he says this. He says, not only is he creator, he's a provider. He's, your, he's the ruler, the ultimate government. He is your governing source. This unknown God that you put on the altar, he is your creator. He is your provider. He, he's what keeps you alive right now. One week from the eyeball of God, and we're all dead. He is, it, God is the reason my heart beats right now. God is the reason my lungs operate right now. God is the reason in all this. And I can tell you right now that I appreciate all the medical help that, pro, that, that, that the medical services can provide. I appreciate all of it. I'm thankful for it. But I can tell you right now that here's the deal. God don't need a ventilator to keep me moving. I'm thankful for it when it's needed, but at the same time, God don't need it. My life is... Somewhere along the lines, I think our society in the last 18 months have forgot that God truly is the giver and taker of life. He's the sustainer of it. He provides bread. He provides life. And if there... Can, can, I, can I chase a rabbit for just a second? If you want to fire me up, 
Take, give me a doctor that looks somebody in the eye and says, if you do this, you're going to die. You don't tell me that fires me up. That fires me up to tell, because that's what, that's what every one of these bona fide educated knuckleheads on social media and on the media world are telling half of everybody, if you do this, and if you go out there, and if you go here, and if you do that, if you keep living, you're going to die. I have heard it from the lips of some of the... Uh, it, can, I, can, I, can I testify for just a second? My father is fighting like stage 1000 cancer right now. And I mean fighting it tooth and toenail. He's as tough as stinking nails. I'll go ahead and give that to you right I mean, he, they don't make this type of human anymore. I'm convinced of that because I'm not made of that. I'd have done bowed out in the midst of all of this. My dad is fighting, I don't know what stage of prostate cancer he's in, but it's pretty high up on the totem pole, and he's fighting it tooth and toenail. He was diagnosed with COVID, and he was diagnosed with pneumonia all at the same time, coming one day out of his fifth round of heavy radiation treatment, and from the doctor's perspective, he should be dead. From the doctor's perspective, they've always told him, if you do this, you're going to die. But I can tell you right now that I stood by my daddy as he walked down a ramp, got into his car, loaded up, went to the ear doctor, got tubes in his ear, walked right back up the ramp, sat down in pain and agony through the cancer that's in his bones, not affected by COVID nor pneumonia, oh, once again. He coughed in three days. Don't you sit there and tell me in your medical profession if you do this, you're going to die. That's not your call. That's God's call. Hey, you, that fire, I'm telling you, that burns in my bosom just thinking about it. When did we forget this? I'm not sitting here telling them, listen, listen, I'm not the first, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I'm going to go jumping in a bow off factory. I'm not doing that. But I am telling you this, that it is not a medical doctor's call to tell me that if I do this, I'm going to die. That's God's call. That's God's decision. He's the one that gives life, breath, and all things. He's the giver of that. That's his goodness. And I'm here right now speaking to you, not because I am some good person, but because I'm right here breathing and living. It's because of the very goodness of an almighty God. Boy, it would change. <laughs> I'm trying to move on a Wednesday night, but I can't even get to the best part of this message that Paul preached on Mars Hill because I'm sitting here thinking about the fact that it would change our worship if we realize that the reason that we're still existing is, or, is, uh, is orbiting around the very goodness of the fact that God's letting us live this life. I get to come on a Wednesday night because God's good. I get to read my Bible because good, God's good. I get to pray on my knees because God's good. I get to have a voice because God's good. I get to I get to walk because God's good. I get to move my limbs because God's good. I get to talk because God's good. It is not anything of my ability. It hinges and operates and revolves around the sheer mercies and goodness of an almighty God that allows it to happen. And boy, if the atheistic crowd ever witnessed anything in the life of their heathenistic rage, you hear me right now, they're going to witness on the day of judgment the mercy that God extended to them and how many years he allowed them to live. Before their eye offended. How many red lights did they see? It says you don't have to go down this path. My sheer existence right now. That's what Paul was telling the Athenians. You're not here because you're special. You're here because God's special. <laughs> Hallelujah. I gotta move on. We gotta go to the house. I'm hungry. I was smelling some chili in the crock pot when I left. And I cannot wait. Last one. He is not only creator, provider, ruler. 
He is Savior. He speaks of His greatness, His goodness, His governing, and then He speaks of His grace. He said, at times of this ignorance, God wept. That's what, basically, if you want to know the concept of it, at your, it when we were ignorant, all right, you want to know something about the very mercies of God, all right? Well, Lisa, what day, how old were you? What, 25 when you got saved? 26? Somewhere around in there? 24. 24 years old. 26. 26. <laughs> 26. All right, 26 years old. Preacher's wife got saved in a camp meeting. Grown up in church all of her life. Played the piano, did everything, everything you just, I mean, she don't have a clue what alcohol tastes like. She don't have a clue what a cigarette feels like in her mouth. And the only person that she knows intimately is her husband. That's all, that is on the outside, religiously speaking. But for 26 years, ignorance. And you know what God was doing in his mercy? Winking at it. Morgan, last Wednesday, you know what God was doing up until that point? How old are you, Morgan? I'm 29. 29. You know what? For 29 years, you know what God was doing with his. For 13 years, you know what God was doing with my ignorance? <laughs> he was bearing it. Yep. <laughs> how many of you. <laughs> How many of you have ever walked into a scene and had to just bear it? You winked, you winced, but you bear it. We talk about my daughter's horse, all right? It just turned into a very expensive horse here. Right? And the price keeps rising as that wound keeps getting bigger. <laughs> but that horse, that horse, when we found him last Wednesday evening, his front quarter was sitting over a eight strand bob bar fence. He'd been sitting there for nearly a day because it's been about a day since we'd gone to check him or check the cows. We'd we checked them earlier, and then it, we weren't going to check them again for that. We, we just missed that. It had it, been about 24 hours, basically. Because I checked them that morning the day before, and then it was later on the afternoon of the next day before I ever had a chance to get back out there. So that horse, had something happened along about after the time we checked them to the time that we had uh, to, we come back. And so basically for 15 to 18 hours, that horse had sit there on that five-strand barbed wire fence and went back and forth on it. When Bailey walked in that Wednesday night, I was sitting in my recliner thinking, I'm going to spend this evening drinking a hot cup of coffee, reading my Bible, getting ready for Bible study. I walked out thinking Bailey, and Bailey comes busting up in there hysterically crying, and I'm thinking Bailey's exaggerating. We got just a few, maybe wrapped in some loose barbed wire. He got hung up. He's probably cut to, to one end or the other, but I, it, a little blue, a little purple ointment, we got, we got this. The closer I get to him, the worse I realize it is. I realize that that barbed wire is all the way up inside the muscles. When I go to cutting it out, if I go to pulling it out, you know what I'm doing? I'm wincing and I'm winking at it and I'm having to bear it. And you're thinking to yourself, man, this is nasty, this is gross. Do you not think that how the same disgusting look at that putrid sore on that horse is the way God looks at our sin? And he sees that sin. 
too much to pass judgment, so I'm just going to bear it. How unreal awesome is the... Does that give you an ultimate level of the mercy of God that he just... And the grace of God that I'm winking at your ignorance. But now, at this time, you know what he says? He says, I've winked at, that time, at the times of this ignorance God winked at. But now, guess what he's doing? He is commanding all men everywhere to repent. For a period of time, you, you've operated in ignorance, but now here's what I'm doing. I am not willing that any should perish. God did not send his son to the cross just for a select few. God sent his son to the cross for the entire world. And God has set a demand. He has set a command and a commission upon all the world that if you're going to come back into fellowship with God's good graces, you're going to go through the way, the truth, and the life, and that is Jesus Christ. And the way to get to God is through repentance. Repent. And he has commanded all men everywhere to do one thing, repent. Do you know what the world needs? Repentance. Do you know what Washington needs? Repentance. Do you know what the media needs? Repentance. Do you know what half the drug crowd needs? The majority of the drug crowd needs? Repentance. Do you know what the pimps need? Repentance. Do you know what the religious lost people on the church view needs? Repentance. We're all in the same boat. He said, he's not just your creator. He's not just your provider of life. He's not just your governor ruler. He is your savior. He said, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. By that man. Y'all hear this? You hear me? He is going to judge the world in righteousness. By one standard, that man. And I give you three guesses of what that who that man is, and the first two don't count. Whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that he hath raised him from the dead. And again, same reaction. I'm a, you, they just heard that the unknown God is their creator, is their provider, their ruler, and he is their savior. And at one point in time, he says this, I'm going to judge you in righteousness by one standard, Christ Jesus. Do you know what God's not going to judge us by? Or church attendance. Do I think you need to be in church? Yeah, I do. I really do. I, I, I think it's one of the most missed priorities in today's society is the, is the consistency of the church. I think you need to be in church, but God's not going to judge you by that standard. God's not going to judge you by the amount of money you give in an offer plate. He's not, he, that's not his standard. God's not going to judge you by whether you're rich or poor. That's not his standard. God's going to judge you and me by one standard, the righteousness of Christ. Watch this. Watch this. In Rome, if you was to flip over and study Romans chapter 5, he has justified those who have believed. This the word justified means deemed righteous. So you go to 1 John chapter 5. He that hath the Son hath life, he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So guess what? If I have Jesus in my life, then guess what? I have the standard by which God's going to judge. I am not going to be judged. So in other words, God's judgment is going to pass from me on to Jesus Christ because Jesus, I've been deemed righteous by the righteousness of Christ, not by my own righteousness. I've been declared righteous by God, not by my standard, but by the righteousness of Christ who has been put on my account. 
In other words, I was broke. I was dead in my trespasses and sins, as, as Ephesians tell me. I was dead in trespasses and sin. And you know what happened? I was as, when it comes to righteousness, I was as broke as a joke in the middle of it. I couldn't work my way out of it. I can't pay my way out of it. I can't good deed my way out of it. I can't church attend my way out of it. I can't uh, baptize my way out of it. But I can tell you what I can do. I can put my faith and trust. And you know what Paul said as he was standing on Mars Hill that day? He said, that unknown God you're talking about, you may have your devotion to all those other gods, but I'm going to tell you, you can throw them in the woods. You can burn them in the next brush pile. There's one God. He is creator. He is provider. He is ruler. And praise God, he is the Savior. And you don't have to try to good your way through it. All you have to do is put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God, the, the, the Son of God Himself, the one who has defeated death out of the grave. You put your faith and trust in Him, and God Himself on the day of judgment will declare your, your, you righteous, not by your merit, but by His. And yet, 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 When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, they mocked. Some mocked. Others said, I'm going to repeat that. Now don't get too mad at them. Because I guarantee half of us have done the same two things. Do you really think it took, how many of you, was there anybody in here that responded to the gospel the first time you ever heard it? No. When you hear it, when we hear it again on this matter. So Paul, guess what? This is scary. He departed among them. Some mocked him. Some questioned it. it says that others played to him and believed. I wish the church. America right now. Listen to Paul's message on Mars Hill. Paul stood before a group of idol worshipers. He said, you don't even know what you're worshiping. There's a message that can pre be preached in every pulpit across America. You worship it. I know this bothers some people to say this, but God is my government, not Washington. I hate to tell Kay out, but she's not my governor. God is. Now, thank you, Jesus, that my Bible tells me that those that are governed by God are good citizens, too. Y'all know what I'm saying. They're good citizens. But I got news for her. I got news for Congress, the Senate. And all the baby killing lawmakers that are up there in Washington. They're not my government. God is. But most importantly, he's my Savior. And the only way you can really know it. I want to stand on a Wednesday night and say, I'm glad he knows me. And I know him. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your word. Thank you for this message. Lord, I just want to hold this in my heart. It's trying to have to read it. You may have to take me back to Mars Hill many times to remind me of who you are what you are in my life. I love you. I want you to know I appreciate everything you do for us. I appreciate this country. I appreciate it. I love this place. I love my country. 
But I can't hit, sit here. And the, I can't sit here honestly and say that I'm not stirred like Paul was stirred at the idolatry that I see. God help us all to be witnesses, as Paul was on Mars Hill. Not to go in there throwing darts and swords and stones, but to walk in there and start on a platform where everybody is on the same level. Give it to them straight, but declare thus said. Help us to take the truths that we've learned and live by them and honor them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, church, I appreciate you coming tonight. I know this was a uh, this was a long one. I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, <laughs> at the same time, I love you. Uh, we got food distribution this week, uh, this Saturday, one more time. This may be our last one that we get. Uh, depends on what get from suppliers and uh, how that works but we got we know we got one more this Saturday so uh, just be praying about that if you can come we're going to start distributing food around 9 a.m. Uh, I pulled in at about 8 and there was already cars lined up all the way around the side of the building here so if you can come and be a part of that we always use some help the only thing I can offer you is it's going to be cold and uh, it'll be it'll be a lot of work, but it'll be a blessing. I can guarantee you that to be able to take care and help people with their food. Um, that's this Saturday. Our Christmas service is uh, the twentieth. Uh, we got a Christmas service coming up. We <laughs> it keeps uh, it keeps developing into something more and more, and I'm excited about it. Um, my mind and everybody else's minds coming together on this, and I'm looking forward to it. We're going to have a Christmas service, and we're going to. Uh, uh, and I'm almost positive, uh, unless God changes it, we're going to uh, observe communion on, on our Christmas. So uh, just in your mind, be preparing and praying towards that. We're going to have a fellowship afterwards in the building down here. We're going to eat together, have a great Christmas service before the Christmas uh, time rolls around. Uh, we won't have Wednesday night that week. Uh, we've got, we'll begin through chapter 18 of the book of Acts. We'll pick back up on it after Christmas. And uh, uh, after, other than that, that's all the announcements I got. Listen, I love you, church. I appreciate you. Uh, hope you have a blessed week. God bless you. Y'all dismissed.